Hey, Sanjay. Hey, Nathan. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Hello. Namaste. In a world of Namaste. social distancing, we are not allowed to hug or shake hands. So therefore, never mind that I can't actually shake hands or hug you because it's kind of virtual, right? Yeah. Anyway, how's everyone doing? Good. 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 Wow. Excellent. Are you, are you getting this droning noise? Droning noise. No, those are called voices in your head. Okay, I'm going to give everyone a few minutes to join. I am going to, yeah, thanks, Alex. A window. Mm. Mm. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Excellent. OK, let's give everyone a minute to join. And then we'll be good. Hi, I'm not Just lost somebody. All right, so first some housekeeping. So if you guys are referring to the doc, uh, the Google doc, we updated the links for the classes from the previous days. Uh, we also uh, added uh, links to the videos. Uh, actually, there's just one video from yesterday. Uh, the first two days will be a secret between us all, since there was no video. Um, but hopefully, the notes that are being posted can help you guys go back and revise stuff um, that is relevant. OK. Uh, let me just see what time is it. It's 5.50. OK, let's, let's get started. OK, so uh, today, we are going to cover something that i think all of us um, can relate to and uh, all of us can uh, understand which is now that we learned a few things about uh, data and how data is stored uh, remember that when we started the, the class we talked about 
how computers are built. So we talked about, uh, let's start from applications. So applications are these, these programs that are written by programmers using programming languages. The programming languages take source code, convert that into object code or executable code, which then can run on hardware. And uh, Alex covered some very, as they say, low level hardware concepts in terms of what is a transistor. So a transistor turns on and off. That's all it can do, pretty simple. Uh, when you take a bunch of transistors, you throw them together, you can start to make more complex circuits. But let's start with what a transistor can do fundamentally. A transistor is a switch which can be on or off. Uh, with, with multiple switches thrown together, you can start to form patterns of, of on, and, on and off. Right. If you have uh, one switch, you have two patterns. If you have two switches, you have four patterns. If you have three switches, you have eight patterns. Essentially, it's two to the power of the number of switches, and that's the number of combinations or number of of um, of uh, different states or different patterns that we can create. Uh, if we take eight switches, we throw them together, you get uh, eight bits, which is called a byte. Uh, a computer can often process. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a, a computer can process multiple bytes at a time. Uh, the maximum size or the maximum number of bytes that a computer can process um, at any given time. So if you can process, let's say, two bytes at a time, that's 16 bits. So we say that that computer can process a 16-bit word, right? So we went from transistors, which are switches, to bits, bits to bytes, bytes to words. And uh, once we have this concept of words, whether it's 16-bit words or 32-bit words or 64-bit words, depending on, the, uh, on, on how advanced or how capable your computer actually is, uh, then we start going into some other higher level concepts. Now, what can we do with these words? Can we store numbers in memory? Uh, what type of memory can we store the numbers in? We can store the, the, the numbers or the alphabet or the characters in flash memory, which means that even when I turn off my computer, it's still going to persist. It's still going to be there. So I can come retrieve it later. Or I can go pull this data into RAM. And the benefit of pulling it into RAM is Hey, guys, can yeah, let's be really careful not to mute me on the call. Uh, so I don't want anybody muting me except for themselves. If you do that, then we'll have to bump you off the call, okay? Just be really careful. Um, so uh, where was I? So I was talking about how you can load data into RAM. And uh, when you load data into RAM, you can then have the programs work on the data to transform the data or convert the data into something more usable or something more uh, perceptible, something that you can experience, right? Whether it's a photograph or a song or a video, this is nothing but data being manipulated or modified inside of RAM. Uh, after that, we we looked at uh, what can we do with this with this data. Data can be used to represent numbers. It can be used to represent characters using ASCII. Uh, ASCII, of course, is kind of limited. It has only 127 different possibilities. If you're doing something which is more complicated, uh, you need to have a more expanded set of options. So you have something called Unicode, which is up to 65,536 possible states, uh, which then now can be used to represent more complex characters, like, for example, Chinese characters or um, uh, you know, Roman characters, which, which, which have accents, for example, in European languages, uh, or perhaps even you know, Cyrillic characters, so on and so forth. But we can also use data to represent things like photographs. And we looked yesterday at the two photographs of uh, flowers, right? We looked at uh, a, flowers, a photograph of yellow flowers, which was not compressed. And then we looked at another um, equivalent or the same photograph, but which had been compressed. And the benefit of compression is you use far less space to store this data. But of course, the downside of compression is you might end up losing some data you know, or some fidelity, right? It may not be ex an exact representation of uh, what the original thing was. 
but that's okay, right? I mean, as long as uh, it's very efficient to store the data, you might be okay with losing some fidelity. Uh, and the reason you're okay with that is as long as you can still perceive that data fairly accurately and it's enjoyable to you, whether it's a photograph, whether it's a music stream or a song that you're playing from Spotify, or whether it's a, a movie you're watching on Netflix, or indeed this video call, which is massively compressed as I'm sending it from my camera over to you and all your video that's being sent to me or to each of us, uh, again, being massively compressed, transmitted over the internet and ultimately delivered to our computers. So with that brief background now, what I want to do is I want to talk about uh, what are we going to learn today? So today we're going to look at a very practical application of everything we've learned so far, which is images. I mean, images are kind of fun. They're photographs. Uh, we're going to walk through how computers actually take images, like how do they actually capture images? Uh, how are they stored? And we'll just look at some very simple code which we can write which helps us to modify images as well. So kind of fun stuff today. Uh, let's start with some basics, OK? So the first thing to talk about is let's talk about digital cameras, something that we all should be pretty familiar with. Um, obviously, uh, the days are kind of going now when we used to have these huge digital cameras that did nothing but took photographs. And you had a memory card that you put into the camera. You guys may remember some of that. Uh, these days, your digital camera is usually something like this, which is your phone, right? And the important thing to know is that if you look at my phone, even here, you see these three things. They're called lenses. Lenses are just pieces of glass that can focus the light rays onto something called an image sensor, which is what you're seeing here on the slide. So the image sensor is something made of silicon. It's a, it's a chip. And what it does is it actually changes um, it, 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 it's almost like a solar panel in a way where when you put sunlight on it or you put light on it, it creates an electrical charge. Okay, so it, it generates electricity once, it, once light falls on it. And then that electricity, the intensity of that electricity can be captured into uh, a bunch of, of uh, data. And then once we have that data, we can start to interpret it as a photograph. So the lens, which is the glass part of the camera, focuses the light. And if you guys all have cameras in front of you right now, you can kind of look look closely at the camera and you'll kind of see there's a small little hole in the center. That hole is called an aperture, which captures the light, focuses the light, concentrates the light onto something that looks very much like this that you're seeing here. And this is a rather large sensor, as you can see. This person is holding their fingers perhaps maybe two inches apart. But the sensors in these things are incredibly small and yet incredibly powerful. So what happens is that the the camera gathers this data and it um, it then captures this 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 information as a series of bits and bytes and then it starts to make sense of what those bits and bytes are so the first thing i want to do is i want to show you uh, what what actually happens and remember yesterday we took a close look at our screens and we found that if you go really close to the screen it doesn't really look like characters or or uh, boxes but in fact it looks like a series of little dots okay uh, each dot is called one pixel of an image and i want to show you something really interesting i'm going to go back here switch to the file that we saw yesterday right can you guys see this thing and what i'm going to do is i'm going to slowly zoom in okay so as i zoom in you'll start to see that this thing becomes blurred uh, but it's not really becoming blurred. What I'm doing is I'm kind of taking a magnifying glass and going down into the details. And you'll notice that every yeah, we don't see it. someone's... Uh, we don't see it. Some, oh, you don't see it? Okay, let me, let me just do that real quick. Hang on one second. Uh, let me go back here and... Uh, okay. You see it now? Yes? Yeah. OK, cool. Thanks, guys. So I, I fired up this image, which we call flowers.jpg, right? It's a JPEG or a file format for storing flowers. And uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and zoom into this flower, OK? So as I zoom into the flower, you'll notice that it becomes these boxes, you see? And each box is only one color. See, like this box is a little more yellow. That one's a little more gray, right? 
this effect that we see here when we really, really, really zoom into the data, we call this pixelation because now you guys know what pixels are, right? Pixels are an individual dot or or um, an individual point, which when we have enough points that are small enough that our eyes can't really tell the difference and we see them all together, they end up looking like something that we can understand more abstractly as a flower or I don't know, a dog or you know a, a, a scene of a beach or indeed photographs of ourselves and our own families, right? So it's really interesting to go back to the basics and, and, and remember that in the end, Every photograph is comprised of multiple pixels. And each pixel, as I told you yesterday, is in fact comprised of, um, each pixel is just one color, as we saw. And each pixel is, is representative of one little dot from this sensor, this camera sensor, that, that was used to capture these different pixels, right? Pixels are typically stored in a grid, which is why our photographs are kind of square or rectangular, right? I think it's just an easier way to manufacture them. And so there's no real reason why our photographs should be rectangular or should be square. They could probably be circular or something like that. But when we look at manufacturing these things, you know, in a, in a very large way in a factory, it's easier to just make them in squares and, and uh, rectangles so that we can cut them and then we can put them onto a circuit like this and we can make uh, essentially a digital camera. Now, when we look at, at pixels and, and what we're doing uh, with pixels here in kind of image, um, uh, image processing or, or creation of digital photos, what we like to do is we like to define things. Some of you may have studied geometry, some of you may not have, and that's okay. Uh, so what we'll say is that we, we usually start counting pixels to kind of figure out the math. What we try to do is we say, let's, let's, let's figure out how many pixels there are. I see some of you guys having a really good discussion on how many pixels might be there in a typical camera, whether it's eight megapixels or three megapixels or 12 megapixels, which you often see on the high-end phones today. Um, and the way those pixels are arranged are in a grid. If we want to modify the color of a specific pixel, we have to know which one we're trying to modify, right? Remember that many of these pixels kind of come together to make a photograph. And so the computer programs that that adjust the colors of these photographs, so when you increase the lighting or you kind of put a filter on, on Snapchat or something, that's nothing but just adjusting the pixels, adjusting each pixel with a different color so that it looks like you're wearing the bunny ears or something like that on Snapchat, okay? So in order to know which specific pixel to go adjust, you have to, say which specific pixel you're trying to adjust. You can say, I want to adjust pixel number 3042 from the left side, but pixel number 1074 from the top. Okay, so what we do, uh, this, this is very simple geometry, is we say that, let's assume that the top left-hand corner of the grid is zero, zero, okay? And then anything that's on the horizontal plane or horizontal axis, we call the x-axis, and anything that's on the vertical plane or, or the vertical axis, we call the y-axis. And then we, we do some basic geometry where we say that, hey, this pixel is at location x comma y, which is location 0 comma 0. So if I try to tell you that, hey, you know what? I want to go change pixel number 4 comma 3. What I'm actually talking about is pixel number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 comma zero one two three. So um, pixel number four comma three would be this pixel whose um, property or whose color I'm going to change in order to uh, create an effect or make a modification to this picture so that it looks better, okay? So that's how this, this works. Uh, let me go back again because this is very important to understand. You have a sensor also called a charge coupled device, which means that when we expose the sensor to light, it generates electricity. That electricity is generated in different intensities, which is which is uh, based on what color of light is falling onto the sensor. So if a yellow flower, like the light that's reflected off a yellow flower falls onto this thing, it generates a certain level of electricity, which then the, the programs or the applications inside the phone or inside the camera go translate into pixels. And remember from yesterday, what is, what is a pixel? A pixel is nothing but uh, a representation of color at a certain point, right? And how do we change these colors? So remember again from yesterday, uh, every pixel 
if you go really, really, really closely and, and look at a pixel, every pixel is actually comprised or consists of three unique dots. Okay, And those three unique dots are very similar to a prism or a rainbow, where there are some very basic colors like red, green, and blue that come together. And depending on the level of red, green, and blue that we have, we can change the color of that pixel. Okay, So the important thing here to know is that every pixel, like I said, is comprised of three individual dots, or three individual light sources. We can change the color of every individual light source. And uh, every pixel is stored in four bytes. Forget about transparency for now. We won't talk about that. But just for the sake of simplicity, every pixel is stored in three bytes. Okay, One byte, which means you have eight bits to tell you what level of red. The second byte, eight bits to tell you what level of green or what intensity of green. And the third one, which is the blue byte, which tells you the intensity of blue. And so let's go to this other web page over here. Can you guys see this right now? It's like a should be a big black square. You guys see this? Yes? Yeah. OK, good. Yeah, thank you. So you'll notice now that this black square, there's a slider here on the left-hand side. And uh, this slider represents the intensity of red, green, and blue that we're going to see across this big black square. OK? So if all I do is I just keep sliding this to the right, OK? you'll see that I see more and more and more red show up on that screen. You see that? At the same time, please note the number over here, OK? So we are changing red from 0 to a maximum of 255. Why 0? Why 255? Because in this particular implementation or this particular representation, we are using one byte of data, which is 8 bits of data, which can have a value from 0 to 255 to represent how much red we're going to have in this particular photograph or this particular pixel, not photograph, sorry, this particular pixel. Okay. Now, similarly, I can do this for green. I'm going to take the red and take it back down to zero. And for green, I can do the same thing. I can keep adding green, right? And the greener I make this thing, ultimately it becomes pretty green, right? And similarly, I can do the same thing for blue, okay? But now the fun thing is, remember what I told you, that every single color in a computer or every single co color can be represented by a combination of these three basic colors, very similar to a prism or very similar to a rainbow, right? So there's a question, how do you get white? Great question. So first thing, let's look at if I take the red and I slide it to the maximum, right? Now I'm going to take the green. I'm going to start adding green to this red, OK? And it's not really clear right now, but if you look at this bottom section here, you'll see more and more green. And if you look here, you'll see the combination of the two colors, OK? So we're going to keep doing this. We're going to keep adding. And you can see, as I'm adding more and more and more green to this red, it's turning orange. Look at that. And even more, and even more, and even more green that I add, ultimately, if I go full green, full red, sorry about that, full green, full red, I get a nice bright yellow, OK? So you can see that simply by adjusting the level of green and red, I've created a bunch of different colors that can go anywhere between pure black to you know pretty vibrant yellow okay now let's do something more interesting let's start adding blue to this okay so we start adding blue and you can see the blue kind of show up over here as the independent color so you know that we're adding more and more blue oh look what's happening that color is actually changing and when i go max red green blue that's when i get white OK, so now let's do some just some quick experiments. We don't have time, obviously, to play with every single combination of red, green, and blue in this particular um, class. So let's just kind of set it to halfway, 256. So we'll set it to like 128 red, or thereabouts. We'll set it to 128 green, red right about. And then we'll do 128 blue, thereabout, right? So you can see you get this kind of weird gray kind of color on the screen. And that's kind of telling you you're neither here nor there. Right, So everything's kind of set halfway, neither here nor there. Now I can go and max out the blue. I can take down the green. I get this purple. I can max out the red. I get this pink. I can do some other cool things, like I can go this way. I can go this way. But you can start seeing that by simply changing the value or changing the number, which is representing red, green, and blue. And remember, all of this is translating back down to those basic concepts of bytes and bits that we talked about. right? 
each pixel on the screen is being represented by three numbers. The three numbers indicate how much red, how much green, how much blue for each pixel. And so if I have 2,000 pixels on my entire screen over here, I have 2,000 uh, values like this for each red, for each green, for each blue that represent these, this entire thing that we're seeing over here, OK? So uh, hopefully that gives you some background into how is color represented on a screen? How does a photograph capture the color or capture the um, uh, capture the details of whatever it is you're kind of taking a photograph from. When we send out the notes later on, I want you guys to go review this video. There's a video actually linked here. I don't want to play it right now, but I think it's kind of interesting. It's a YouTube video, uh, which isn't about burgers. It's, uh, it's a video that uh, actually shows you how cameras work. And I'm purposely not sending this out right now because I don't want us to get uh, derailed in this in this particular meeting. But I want us to go look at this. Uh, it only takes about six, seven minutes to look at this video. It's really fun. And it tells you how cameras work, OK? So definitely go take a look at that um, later on. So let's talk, about, let's talk about this. Now let's kind of go back to, to this, OK? And I'm going to go make this large over here. What I'm going to show you, that was an interesting concept. So we're going to go zoom in. OK, so on my screen, if we look at this this over here, kind of between here and here and here and here, that's about one inch by one inch. OK, one inch by one inch. OK, would you guys agree? One inch by one inch. And you can see that if I had only five pixels on the screen, then I really wouldn't be able to tell what this thing actually is. OK, I'd only be able to tell. Oh, that looks like some green and something kind of looking like yellow, right? But as I add more pixels per inch, so I kind of cram more and more pixels into the same space on the screen or the same space on my screen, or in fact, the same space on a printed photograph, perhaps, you notice that, oh, you know what? I start to see more meaning in this now. OK, well, I don't really still know what this is. But now, oh, now I can clearly tell that they're flowers, right? But they still aren't very sharp. They still look kind of jagged. They still look kind of, you know, kind of weird. And what I want to do is keep adding more and more pixels per inch to the point where if I make this kind of really small, you can see how sharp that photograph actually looks. Looks really, really, really sharp, right? So the lesson here is that a pixel is a pixel. But the more pixels I can jam into a smaller space, the sharper, the more vibrant, the more beautiful my photograph looks. And that's the reason why, generally speaking, if you want a higher quality image, what you're looking for is a higher pixel density, right? which is the number of pixels per inch or dots per inch. Okay, If I'm looking for something that looks really clean and beautiful and sharp, I want more dots per inch. So let's look at some, some dots per inch. What is a good enough dots per inch? Right? Clearly, 5 was bad, because when you saw the 5 that I had earlier, it looked kind of jagged. We couldn't even tell what it was, right? And then when we start adding more and more and more pixels per inch, it just got more and more and more beautiful. So the question is, well, why don't you have like 1,000 pixels per inch? Why don't you have 5,000 pixels per inch? Because you know, at some point, it becomes just really complicated and really hard to go jam that much into a sensor that's this small, right? So these cameras, for example, are 12 mega pixels. And recall from our class yesterday that a mega something is a million something, right? So we're saying there's 12 million pixels crammed into this small little sensor that's in the corner over here, right? And you go like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. 12 million pixels in such a small area. And that's probably like five millimeters by five millimeters, right? So what we're saying is the more pixels you have per inch, the more beautiful the image, which is why when these phone manufacturers are trying to sell you on, on cameras, they're telling you, oh, it's a 12 megapixel camera. Or Samsung will tell you, I have a 16 megapixel camera. Because what they're trying to sell you is, hey, if you have more pixels per inch or more megapixels, more million pixels on the same size of screen, right? then that photograph will just be that much more beautiful and more vibrant to look at. Okay, So generally, 100 dots per inch is good. 
that's what they say. This uh, screen I have in front of my face right now, you guys can't really see this too well, uh, or you can't see it at all. It's about 20 inches wide. And it happens to have maybe about, you know, 3,000 or so pixels on the horizontal axis. So if we look at 3,000 pixels divided by 20 inches, you're looking at about, you know, maybe 150 or something, you know, pixels per inch, something like that. Uh, and and that's uh, that, that's actually pretty good. You know, that's pretty good. Like it's it's fine. It's uh, it's a 150 dots per inch, not bad. And an iPhone's display uh, usually has about 400. This is an old set of slides. Uh, there's 400 dots per inch on an iPhone these days. In fact, the smaller iPhone has an even more, um, uh, more yeah, a smaller iPhone like the, the the smaller size. This is the Max or the Pro. The, the 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 smaller one has even a sharper resolution on it. Amazingly so, because they just didn't want to complicate the software, so they kind of you know put more uh, more pixel density into it. Now, for you guys who may be familiar with things like virtual reality, uh, you need these glasses that you wear, right? And so those glasses are really, really, really close to your face. If you go closer to your screen like this, remember yesterday you could see dots on the screen, right? So imagine clearly the number of dots per inch on your screens at home is not good enough for virtual reality because in virtual reality, the screen is literally this close to your face. So for something like virtual reality applications, you need to have very, very high dots per inch, also called resolution. This is a different way of a different word that is used, which tells you what this dots per inch kind of thing is. So when we talk about resolution, we usually talk about two numbers. We talk about you know something by something. So full HD or high definition resolution is, is usually 2,000 pixels by 1,080 pixels, 1920 by 1080. Who set these numbers? Why did they set them like this? Is this logical? Not really. There's a bunch of history here which kind of led to these numbers kind of coming about these ways. We can go through that in a maybe some future class that you take. But um, the interesting thing of the of the conversation here to to again note is that uh, pixels are only one color. The color of each pixel is determined by what the red the green and the blue value is set to, right? And uh, sorry, I have a lot of light behind me here, so I'm trying to see. And, and so uh, when we actually look at this, we, we find that all these pixels come together. The more pixels you have per inch or the more dots per inch that you have, the better the quality of the image that you're actually looking at. And uh, that's a very pleasing thing to look at. And so generally we want to buy TVs or buy phones or buy cameras that have a higher megapixel or resolution or dots per inch kind of um, uh, metric or, or feature or specification because that's better for you in terms of perception. So why don't we just do that? Why don't we just do that? Because it's expensive, right? I mean, the more stuff that you try to cram together, the, the more intricate, the more complicated something is, Imagine, first of all, your sensors have to be pretty freaking good, right? The next thing is your software has to be really good. The next thing is the applications have to be really fast to manage or manipulate all this data. All of that leads to more complex hardware, more complex software, more RAM, more flash, and in the end, that ends up costing more, right? So this is the reason why when you look at different phones, like a Pixel 3a phone or a Pixel 4 phone or an iPhone versus an iPhone Pro versus an iPhone Pro Max. These things have specifications like this, which is screen size, dots per inch, megapixels of the camera, how fast the processor is, how much storage or flash memory exists, how much RAM exists in the phone. And all these things come together to make a pretty complicated piece of equipment that we call our phones or our computers, OK? OK. So let's talk a little bit about uh, displays and how they work, right? Obviously, you're, you're all looking at a display right now. As we explained, every single display has a bunch of pixels on it, right? Your typical display has, like in this case, you can think about this is about 2,000 by about 1,000. So that's about 2 million pixels if you have this resolution of screen, OK? Uh, if you have. A 4K TV, oh my gosh, that's 
even more pixels. It's a ton more pixels because now this number goes to 4,000, right, for, uh, horizontally, and this number goes to 2,000. So 2,000 by 4,000 is 8 million pixels on a screen, OK? So if you have a 4K display, it's just so much more processing and so much more complex, and you're just jamming that many more pixels. And so if you go on Amazon and you look at the price of uh, um, uh, uh, HD display or HD monitor, right? If you look at the price of a 4K display or 4K monitor, or you look at the difference in the price between a HD TV, which is a 2, 2 million pixel television set, versus a 4K TV, which is an 8 million pixel television set, remember that you have four times as many pixels on a 4K TV, and you still you still have it in the same size, if it's a 50-inch TV or 60-inch TV or whatever it is. But that's the reason why the 4K TV is so much more expensive, OK? So how does it work? So what happens is you need light, right? Because what we see, what our eyes perceive, is actually light. It's just light hitting the back of our eyes, which is the retina of our eyes. And the retina, believe it or not, is very similar to a camera sensor. Okay, the retina also has red, green, and blue sensors. In our eyes, we call these things rods and cones, but here we call them you know, pixels or charge couple devices on the sensors of the camera. But it's all very similar, right? If we have to capture images and process them, then our own eyes, our own retinas are like digital cameras, which are grabbing that information, sending it to the brain, which is our computer, and then making sense of what we see in front of us, right? Now, in this case, in the case of a display, the display has to generate some pixels. And the first thing about perceiving sight is creating light, right? If you have light, then you can see something. The light bounces off something, and it, and it, it reveals the color of what it is that we're looking at. So there's a type, different types of displays. There's a type of display called liquid crystal display. What this means is when I apply uh, an electrical current to a pixel on the liquid crystal display, that electrical current turns the light on or off. OK, that's what it does, it on or off. And so imagine now if each pixel has red, green, and blue, right? I can do two things here. First of all, I can decide how much red, how much green, and how much blue. I can do that with a program. And the second thing I can do is I can decide how much light I'm going to let shine through each pixel. And then, according to that, I get the brightness or dimness of the screen, right? If you guys have ever been uh, you know, watching TV late at night or kind of trying to hide under the covers with your phones, not that any of you guys ever do that, right? You, you may not want your parents to notice that you're under the covers with your phone doing something on the internet you shouldn't be doing late at night. So you turn down the, the intensity of the screen. You kind of swipe down like this, and then you have this little thing here, and you kind of swipe down. That's actually saying, hey, send less electrical current through my liquid crystal display so less light shines through. right? So you still perceive the colors. You still see the thing that you're trying to see. It becomes a little harder to see because you're pushing less light through it. Okay, So that's how, that's how displays work. There's different types of displays. There's liquid crystal displays. There's something called LED displays, which is light emitting diode type displays. Those displays are also pretty interesting. They uh, they operate in a in, in, in they operate on the same principle, but they are built completely differently. Okay, in the liquid crystal display, what happens is the electric current going through the display turns the pixel on or off, and it acts kind of like shutting your eyes. Okay, that's how LCD works. In LED, it's like your eyes are always open, but somebody else is turning up and down the lights outside. So it's a subtle difference, but the question is which one is better. OK, what's the difference? As it turns out, LEDs are better because they have more vibrant light. They, they have much better, more accurate light. You can control them more precisely. So especially as you're packing the screen really, really, really tight together so that you have very high DPI or dots per inch, LEDs just end up with a more pleasing, more natural way of looking at the, of, of representing the photograph. Another cool thing about LEDs is uh, think about think about them as I mean they are essentially switches right on or off right and you can shut them off completely which means the black part of the screen looks really black when you turn off an LED which is nice because if you have a really dark night you know it doesn't look kind of gray and washed out 
In the case of LCDs, because LCDs are like shutters, it's almost like a bright morning outside, but someone pulled the curtains and some light kind of still comes through. And so blacks are not really represented that clearly with LCDs. So as time has gone by, most of the manufacturers these days, the cost of LEDs has come down because people are making a lot of them. The physics has gotten better. The semiconductors have gotten better. The manufacturing processes have gotten better. That now we hardly ever see LCDs or liquid crystal displays in the market for anything that's worthwhile. We mostly see LEDs in the market, which are just much, much, much better. However, nothing is you know truly perfect. And so with LEDs, you, you guys can see this part, this part of my screen down here, right? Where I'm kind of cycling through uh, the different applications that I have open. You'll notice that no matter what I present to you, this thing kind of stays here on all the time. OK, and the reason it's this way is because I programmed it to be that way because I want to easily access my applications. The problem is every single second that I'm working, right? I may be changing these slides like this. I may be doing something. Something's changing. But in this particular case, this is always on. This section of the screen is always on. What this does is it actually creates some sort of a permanent effect of this image just in this area of the screen. Okay, this is very similar to you know the old um, uh, kind of people would show you an image that you look at for a few seconds and you concentrate really hard and then you take it away and then they say close your eyes and you still see that image kind of going around in your eyes, right? So that is. So that is something that is very similar to this, where if you have these same pixels on all the time, then sometimes this pattern can get burned into the screen. And that can happen over a very, very, very long period of time, like maybe five, six, seven years of using the same screen, if you don't do a good job of, of you know, turning these sorts of things off. But you know that, that that's OK, because I do so much work in the day. Like, see, if I switch here, for example, it goes away. So I'm not too concerned about it. So. There's even newer technology called AMOLED, right? Which which stands for um, uh, Active Matrix Organic Light Emitting Diode. Okay, I told you I was good with acronyms. I can even tell you what Alex Barreto stands for, but I'll tell you that later. Uh, so the cool thing about about AMOLED is is it's uh, it's an even more advanced way of making LEDs. Which, which further improves the performance of the LEDs so that these become even brighter. But then you can start to avoid some of the problems that you see with traditional LEDs, OK? So at this point, some revision, right? We can edit or change pixel colors to change images. Every pixel has only one color. We can change the color of an individual pixel by manipulating how much intensity of red, green, or blue we put through it. Right. Uh, remember that every pixel is represented by three colors: red, green, blue. Every color is represented by one byte, okay, uh, which is eight bits. Which means I can have up to 255 values or 255 intensity levels for red or green or blue. Pretty cool. And now every pixel on my screen comes together to form an image or a video or whatever it is. Right. And when I have a ton of pixels, I have a very high dots per inch, I see a crisp, beautiful image. If I have few pixels on the screen, very low dots per inch, I see those jagged edges. Doesn't look very good, doesn't look very fun. And so the higher quality displays and cameras have very high resolution, which is a word used for displays, or megapixels, which is a, a, a metric or a specification used for cameras. But it's really the same thing. It's like the number of pixels that you have on the screen is, is really the resolution or the megapixels of the camera. And then the dots per inch uh, tells you, hey, this is a really, really good high quality um, display or high quality image that you have access to. OK, okay. so uh, we're about. 40 minutes in, um, we're going to now start looking at, hey, when we start changing the color of pixels, like how can we actually do this? Like how can we literally do this, right? I will look at some very simple, very simple code and very simple ways of manipulating the images. Uh, you can imagine after we've gone through this, what actually happens in real life when you're manipulating images like on Snapchat with filters and things like that. It's far more complicated, but it's essentially the same idea. Essentially, when you put a filter of 
of a, a Mickey Mouse hat on your head and you show that to your friends and you have a live video, all that's happening is the camera is detecting the edges of your head, which is a lot of processing. And it says, OK, at this location, change the color of the pixels so that it looks like those Mickey Mouse ears or whatever it is that you're trying to show your friends. OK, so, so quite fun, quite interesting. Uh, we're going to look at something. We're going to look at a new function now today. It's going to be called um, simple image. I'm going to tell it to load up or to go retrieve a certain image uh, from memory. I'm going to open this image into the program. And then we're going to start changing it. We're going to start messing with it. Okay. And then you say print the image, it just prints the image. Okay. So with that, let's start looking at some real code. So the first thing I'm going to do. So I'm going to grab the image. Then I'm going to go start manipulating a specific pixel on the screen by changing, by specifying its location. So remember x, y. I'm going to go back here and remind you guys what that was. So remember that in geometry, the top left corner is kind of the, the origin or the 0, 0 point. right? When we say x, y, we say horizontal, comma, vertical. And we're always going to go left to right for horizontal, top to bottom for vertical. So if I say location. 3 comma 3, what I'm really saying is I've gone three steps this way, and then I'm going three steps that way. So I'm referring to this pixel. OK? So when I go here now to the code, the first thing I do is I load up an image. I know how to print that image by using the you know friendly print function that we learned a few days ago. I can go grab a specific pixel from the image because I want to mess with it. I want to change it. And then I can go start changing or manipulating that pixel with a number between 0 and 255, OK? I have some other functions here which specifically set the red, green, or blue value of that specific pixel. So then it allows me to go do some really fancy things with the image. So let's see how we do this, OK? So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to load up an image called x.png. Now, now, PNG is just a, a different type of image format. Uh, it's very similar to JPEG, but it's used, for example, for for, for graphics. Okay, uh, so I'm going to first thing I'm going to define a variable. Remember from yesterday, a variable is like a little box in which I I'm going to pull some content into it. So I use a function called simple image. I load up a, a file called x.png. I throw the file into a variable. So the variable is going to be called img or image. I could call it anything else, really. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom into that image so you guys see the pixel. So I'm going to say, hey, set the zoom. So I want you to zoom it to like 20% or something. And then I'm going to print the image, OK? So this is what we get. Hey, great. We have this x.png. We loaded it. We set a zoom factor. We printed it. Life was good. We're happy. Wonderful. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go through a discussion of how could we set the center pixel of this image, right? to be red and make the center to bottom left corner, center to bottom, I don't even know what they're talking about, center to bottom left corner, diagonal blue. So center to bottom left corner, so maybe maybe we're going to talk about like this one or maybe this one. We'll just, we'll just pick something and deal with it. I don't know what they're really talking about here. So the first thing they're doing is very similar to what they're doing here. They are, they're doing the exact same code, in fact. They're grabbing the image. They're setting the zoom factor and they're printing the image. But remember. I want to set the center pixel to be red. Okay, let's go back here and do some counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I got ten pixels this way, ten pixels this way. What is the center of ten? I mean, it's kind of like sitting right there at the five. But as you can see, five would actually be here. So let's say we want to set this pixel to be red. Okay, this pixel is at location five, comma five. So the first thing we want to do is load up the 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 image so we've done that we're going to set the zoom that's just to display it right let's go over here in fact let's do pixel you look over here they're telling you pixel give is another and i'm going to create a new a new variable called pixel i'm going to use this get pixel function right i'm going to get 5 comma 5 Right? That's going to load up this pixel into memory. OK? One, two, sorry, zero, one, two, three, four, five. So actually, it's this one. Yeah, you're right. <clears throat> and then zero, one, 
two, three, four, five. Okay, so we're going to load up five comma five. The next thing I'm going to do is pixel dot set red, and I'm going to set the red value to the maximum value I can possibly set it to. The next thing I'm going to do is set zoom, and then I'm going to print it. Let's do this. So it's saying pixel isn't defined. What do I do here? Oh, I know what it is. Pix get the pixel from where? From the image. Okay. So I said get pixel, but I didn't say where to get it from. Oh, I want to get it from the image. See, they've done it over here, actually. Image dot get pixel x y right because I have to say from which image I'm trying to grab the pixel. What happened here is important because it goes and reinforces this idea that computers are in fact fairly stupid, which is what we said the first day, right? Unless you tell them specifically what to do, they're going to make a mistake. So here I'm going to do image dot get pixel, and now I'm going to run this, right? And um, hang on, uh, pixel dot set red. What do I do? Alex, you know what's going on what's wrong with this thing? Uh, sorry, I was busy following the chat. What's the problem? No, 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 no. Can so you hear the me? problem. So yeah. So the yeah. set red is is uh, not quite working. I think it's because something else has been, perhaps. Okay. Let me over. let me look into it. You go ahead, and I'll see if I can figure it yeah, out. Yeah, I, I got it working this afternoon. I'm not really sure what I am doing wrong here right now. Uh, pixel dot set red. Uh, Mr. Pixel pixel dot set red. Print the image. Okay, while Alex is looking into that. Should have. Okay, we'll, we'll look into it. We'll figure it out. Just give us, um, give us a second. So. Okay. So well, once we figure this thing out, <laughs> it'll it'll actually show us. Um, get pixel five comma five. So uh, let me let me share my screen. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, how do I do that? Entire screen. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Not yet. Yeah. Okay, let me. Let's reload this. OK, so this is the code that I'm using. So img equals new simple image. New simple image creates a value of type image by reading from this file. Set zoom makes it big enough. It's a very small image. Otherwise, you won't see it. Um, Image.getPixel fetches a pixel at these coordinates. And um, traditionally, in computer science, not always, but most of the time, we start counting from zero. So zero, zero would be the top left corner. Yeah. And then set red 255 makes it red. You know. Uh, so there you go. And we okay. can try something else. We can do try, 10. Try, yeah, try doing 5, 5. Or try doing... Actually, yeah, 10 is too much. We don't have all of that. And 5 doesn't work. Oh, you yeah. know why? Because it's white. Because it is white. Oh. However, so if we do pixel, oh, no. pixel set, say, blue equals zero and pixel set uh, green equals zero, then it'll be red. And now not it's red way. because, not because I'm doing set red, I don't really need the set red. So let's get rid of the set red, okay? And now it's still red, why? Because white is the combination of, you know, full blown red, full blown blue and full blown green, you know, 255, 255, 255. It's only by yeah. setting blue and green to zero that I can let the red shine through and, and be visible as red. Does that make sense to everyone? Let's try some other, let's try some other combination. Is this a, yeah, let's set I, got, blue I, was, I was able to get it to work as well. There you go. So if I set the blue to, you know, not zero, but a little bit of blue, you know, half blue, and, and no green, and we still have the full red from before because the pixel was white to begin with, so it still had full red. So we have red and, and a little bit of blue, and we get you know a purplish red. And what happens if I put full-blown blue? Then it's more purple. You know, red and blue is purple. You know, that kind of makes sense. And if I put the green back to 255, and then it's white again. 
Now, what happens if I do say 128, which is half of the intensity across all three? And now it's gray. Somebody was asking about gray, right? Now you can see the gray is made up of um, you know, all the three colors, red, green, red, blue, and green, red, green, and blue, really, um, with the same intensity. Cool. So okay. let me switch back here. Thank you for that. Let me stop sharing. Let me go back here. OK, can you guys see my screen again? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can see it. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, so now what we're gonna do is we can yeah. say, hey, what if we want to change multiple pixels, right? So we can go image equals new simple image XR PNG image that set zoom twenty, which makes it big enough to see, right? We know that the origin or this particular pixel, right, is pixel zero. So equals img dot get pixel zero comma zero um, if i want to set that pixel to red i would set red 255 on that pixel right if i want to now start changing a bunch of pixels right let's say i want to go change another pixel like the one over here or the one over here what i could do is i could actually just copy this code right down i could go grab a different pixel Let's say I grab pixel zero comma one, which is this one. And I set that one to be red. And then I print the whole thing, right? See, now I changed two pixels at the same time. Sorry. So if I wanted to now write a program where I changed this entire diagonal, right, like this, I changed all of this red, 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 red. I could actually go through and write a whole bunch of, oh, why is this going back? I could go write a whole bunch of, of lines of code here, which kept saying, grab this pixel, set it to red. Grab this pixel, set it to red. Remember, this one was white, which means that it's red, green, and blue values are all set to 255. So I'm going to have to go tone down the value of blue and green so that I can see the red, just like Alex did earlier. Then I'll go grab this pixel. Then I'll go grab this pixel. If you start looking at this, what am I doing? I'm kind of moving over by one every single time. And then I keep doing the same thing again and again and again. But I keep moving down one at a time. Hold that thought, because next week we'll cover a problem like that. I could obviously do this by simply writing a whole bunch of lines of code, for one for each pixel. I could be like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I could write 10 lines of code. But there's got to be a more efficient way to do this, especially if I have 2 million pixels right, on my entire screen and I want to change it. So if I did have 2 million pixels on my screen and I wanted to change it, I could think about a more clever way of doing that, which Alex will cover with us next week. OK. So I think we already did this one, didn't we? Let me do all this one already. Uh, oh, why is it doing that? I keep jumping back and forth. OK, it says set the center pixel to be red. So we did that already. Um, top, red pix top left pixel to be red, we did that already. And finally, we have pixel at 0, 0 to be green. We know how to do this. Uh, OK. So this is this is all stuff that we've done already. And actually, I think with that, we might even be done for the day. So let's quickly revise a couple of things. First of all, computers can do a lot of work. They can manipulate or change a lot of data. However, they're pretty stupid. You have to tell them explicitly what to do. An example of computer stupidity is kind of where I was missing some lines of code there, where I wasn't unhiding the white color, which is what Alex did. And so the computer was supposed to show us red, but it kept showing us white because we weren't very specific in what we wanted it to do. Right. So what this says is, if we are smart and if we know how to program computers, they can do lots of stuff for us. 
We went over images today. We went about how images are formed through pixels, through many, many, many different pixels. And images have a lot of pixels. So if we want to do something for all the pixels in an image, you need to have a different way of programming it. Because if we had to write 2 million lines of code like this, it would be very inefficient, first of all. Secondly, we'd probably make a lot of mistakes if we were to write 2 million lines of code to do, just do something like this. And so we need to have a different and a smarter way of doing it, right? So we'll talk about that next week. And it would work only for an image of 2 million pixels. That's true. That and we true. want to be able to write code that works on different kinds of data or, you know, data with different sizes, like different size images. So you can't do that by writing a line of code for every pixel. Yeah, you got you got to you got to think about how the same code can work on images of different sizes. The same code can apply a Mickey Mouse filter to the to my head, but also can apply a Mickey Mouse filter to somebody else's head on their phone, right? And so this means code that's smart enough to change based on what data is being fed into the system. Okay. So with that, actually today we're we're kind of done a little early. Uh, we're gonna stop and we're gonna ask you guys uh, what questions you have, and we'll we'll take questions for a few minutes, and then we'll say to everyone, um, have a good weekend. So Iggy is asking a question. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, yeah, where is the question? Oh, is there a way of adding a certain amount of red or blue or green to the pre-existing value for that pixel? Uh, the answer is it really depends on the library uh, that we're using to manipulate images. Uh, I would have to investigate uh, the list of methods that are available through the simple image library. I was actually trying to find the, the list of methods. Uh, so if you'll give me a second, I'll try to find that out for you. But I mean, there's a, there's a simple way, actually. So let me, let me show you the simple way. Um, how do I share my screen? Simple way is to ask the, the picture, you know, ask the image, what's the value of the color of a given pixel? And then add to that value and, and set it back into the image. Okay, present, screen, share. I guess should be seeing my screen. Okay. You guys see my screen, right? Yep. Okay. So let's do this. Pixel equals um, IMG get pixel. And we wanted pixel 5.5. Five. And now we have to ask the pixel to give us the red. So pixel get red. Let's see if that works. It works. Print. I want to print the red value. Actually, let's print all three. Print red, green, blue, which I haven't defined yet. Green equals pixel get green. And blue is equal to pixel get blue. Let's print that. And now it shows me that the colors are 250. Oh, gosh, what happened here? So all, oh, I, I can't scroll. Interesting. So now the colors are 255 for all three. Now, if I want to change, uh, let's let's pick a, a pixel, or let's say that I want to reduce the color, right? I want to reduce the amount of blue, for instance. One thing I can do is say new blue is equal to blue minus 100. And then I can do pixel, uh, set blue, new blue. Okay, and that did not work. Oh, I'm so amazed. Why did that not? Uh, and it keeps scrolling to another page. Wonderful. What am I doing wrong? Well, for one thing, I'm not putting semicolons, which are kind of nice, so let's put the semicolons. Is that the right pixel? What happens if I do this? It still doesn't work. Uh, new blue, pixel set blue. Yeah, I don't know. We had set red earlier, right? 
Maybe you can yeah. try adding inside of the parentheses itself. I don't know. Oh, but this should work. That should work. Really cool. Yeah. Maybe you should write print before. But he doesn't want to print it. He just wants to add it to the uh, pixel itself. Yeah. So, but you know what? Here's the maybe issue. Maybe put the maybe. Oh put yeah, the print. printers. Yeah, the printers at the end. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So I was displaying the image first, and then I was changing the the data in memory. But I wasn't changing the data on the screen. I was ch just changing the data in memory. So print has to be at the end, kind of intuitively. So that's one way to do math on your pixels. Okay. Now it is possible that there might be a pixel add red or pixel add blue command uh, but i i have to research that i have to discover whether we have that let's see how i would do that javascript list methods of an object how to list all the methods of an object in javascript object get own property names function to get all the property names linked to an object great thank you how can i copy this Wonderful. Let's go back here. So now we've got our pixel. And I want to print the names of the methods that are available in our pixel. Uh, get own property names. No, that's not that's not working. That is not working. Okay, so I have to do some more research here. Or you guys can do some research too on the weekend. Go look for JavaScript method names or function names for pixels. And that could actually help you. JavaScript. So more research for me. Um, so somebody is saying, I love homework. Well, let me actually give you at least some readings to do over the weekend. Um, for one thing, does everybody have access to the shared uh, Google Doc with yeah. the information from this class? I do. OK. So the Google Doc links to this page which has the list of all the lectures uh, provided by um, Professor Ashley Taylor. So thank you, Dr. Taylor, uh, or Ms. Taylor. I don't know that she has a PhD. Um, today's lesson is images. So it's in section two. Um, and you know, if you click on images, you'll see the slides. But here on the right, there's some interesting exercises, in particular, image to code is uh, for you to play with, right? You can display, it actually works better here than in the slides. So you can write your own code and experiment with modifying our x.png and setting pixels to be red, to be blue, to be green, to be gray. Um, and there's more exercises for you. So I would really like for you to go through this material in preparation for next week's classes, which will be rich in coding. OK? And uh, Sanjay, we're meeting again Monday, right? Not That's over right. The That's right. We're meeting Monday evening. Yep. All right, everyone. All right. Thank everyone you for joining us. Good. Thank you. Have a good evening and have a good weekend. Bye. 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 Thank you. Adios.